Yes, it's clear. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today's session is on uh, Python. Uh, the title of the talk is Python Best Practices. So the motivation for this came about uh, while uh, I am uh, interacting with students and uh, people who are new to Python. So very often I look at the code they write and I give uh, review comments. And very often I found that uh, many of these people have learned another language, be it C or C++ or Java. And Python is typically not their first language. Uh, uh, it's not the first language that they learned. So as a result, uh, what has happened is that the people come with certain habits which they have picked up in other languages, such as C or C++ or Java or any, even JavaScript for that matter. And they try to impose those habits on uh, writing Python code. It doesn't really work because there is a particular way of writing in Python. And uh, you know, it is what Python programmers called Pythonic code. So uh, Python has a lot of simplicity and elegance. And uh, that elegance is lost if you start writing Python code the way you think about in C or C++. So this talk is not for beginner. I mean, it is for beginners and intermediate uh, Python programmers, but you should already know the syntax, basic syntax of Python, the uh, basics of Python. So that is a prerequisite. Otherwise, uh, you will be lost. So we are not going to teach you Python here. We are mainly going to cover how to write Pythonic code. So this talk is uh, organized as part of uh, Devopedia's Engineers Day celebrations. So as you know, in India, we celebrate uh, Engineers Day on September 15th, which is the birthday of Sir M. Vishweshwaraya. And uh, uh, two days back, we had our first talk as part of this series of Tech Talks. Today is the second talk. Uh, Devo, uh, so before I get into the talk itself, uh, something about Devopedia and about uh, myself. Devopedia is a platform as well as a community and uh, you might have seen uh, the website devopedia.org. So uh, Devopedia is partly inspired by Wikipedia in the sense that uh, both are collaborative platforms. Anybody can come in and create an article. Somebody else can come in and improve that article or give a critical comment on that article. So that is how uh, the collaborative platform works. And uh, the uh, motivation for creating Devopedia was that uh, we wanted to simplify the understanding of technology. So you may say there are already lots of sites, uh, you know, giving good documentation, lots of blogs out there. Why do we need another site? Uh, so the answer to that will become apparent when you start reading the articles published on Devopedia. We try to avoid technical jargon as far as possible. We try to explain technology or the concepts using examples, using uh, carefully curated images or video. So, uh, you know, it's difficult for me to explain how Devopedia works. It's better that you experience it. If you are new to Devopedia, you can experience it by reading some of the articles uh, published there. And you will get a clear idea why our articles are better than Wikipedia's articles. So since many of you may be Python programmers, there are a number of articles published on Python on Devopedia. So you can read them for a start. So that's about Devopedia. And uh, I am one of the founder trustees of Devopedia. There are uh, three other trustees. Uh, and my background is uh, actually in telecom for a number of years. I think uh, more than 12, 15 years I worked in telecom. And then uh, for a change, I came out of telecom and then I get uh, started getting involved in community activities. So in that process, uh, you know, I started Devopedia back in, uh, I think 2017, early 2017. Now it's been almost uh, four years. Uh, uh, four, yeah, a little more than four years. So, uh, so Devopedia is now uh, my uh, full-time job. But while I was in telecom, I was primarily involved in uh, 3G, 4G, uh, even 2G for that matter. So mostly in wireless communications. And uh, as part of my activities in Devopedia, I regularly uh, deal with Python code. 
So I learned Python probably five years back, and uh, you know, although uh, Devopedia's system is built on PHP, all the testing is done in Python. A lot of automation is done in Python. Uh, there is a lot of backend stuff which goes on, which is uh, offloaded to Python. Plus, now we are uh, looking at uh, machine learning models, which are also done in Python. So I use Python regularly. Uh, I, I can even say I use it on a daily basis. So the, a lot of the content that we'll be talking today is based on my experience as a Python programmer, plus uh, you know uh, stuff that other Python programmers have written about. So with that introduction, I think I can uh, get started uh, with the actual uh, talk. Although your your microphones are muted, I will give you uh, you know I will pause in between during the session to get some interaction going. So uh, so for a couple of uh, pauses, you will get a chance to ask questions. So let's uh, begin. Uh, so uh, first, probably you should get familiar with the uh, environment that I have on on my end. I am using a I am using a Windows 10 machine and uh, what you see is uh, uh, VS Code as the editor. So in recent versions of VS Code, it's possible to load a Python notebook and execute the notebook within VS Code, which is uh, very handy. So previously, uh, some of you may be familiar, uh, the way to execute a notebook would be to uh, bring up a Jupyter notebook environment and run the notebook from within a browser. You can still do that, uh, but I'm going to show you uh, all the entire uh, session is going to be done on the VS uh, code. Some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Google uh, Colab. So this is a Colab environment from Google. So in Colab as well, you can run the notebook. So I'm just showing you, uh, you know, for beginners who have not used Google Colab, the same notebook can be executed inside uh, Google Colab. But we are not going to look at Colab now. Uh, we will use this uh, environment that I have on my system. So how is this talk structured? Uh, by the way, you don't have to you know, take notes or anything like that because I'll be going quite fast. And all of this code will be available to you at the end of the talk. It will be published online, so you can uh, refer to all the details uh, later on. So the talk is organized into sections, basics, sequences and iteration, naming, functions and classes, file handling. Zen of Python, I'm afraid this is also very important, but we may not have the time to cover this. Uh, so there is quite a lot of stuff even in these earlier sections, so we'll focus on these first. So let's begin. Uh, probably at the uh, end of each, uh, you know, section, I will give a pause and uh, allow you to ask questions. So let's start with the basics. Uh, some of you may be writing code like this. What is the problem with the parenthesis? As you can see here, there is a parenthesis here. So this is actually redundant in Python. This is very common in every other language. Uh, you know, if there is a conditional statement like a if. You do it like this, but in Python, you don't need that. You don't need that parenthesis. It's much simpler to write code like this. If a is less than five, the reason for that is simple. The reason is we don't want to clutter the code with unnecessary uh, characters. We want to keep the code. Uh, the visibility of the code should be very uh, simple. So that's the idea. Uh, for that matter, even the you know other languages, you use curly braces for if statements and else. Python doesn't have that because uh, the if code block and the else code block is recognized by the indentation. So on the same, uh, I mean the idea is the same here. Don't use parenthesis unless it's really required. So you may ask where is parenthesis required? It might be required in a very uh, in some cases like. So maybe you have a very complex statement like this, where you know you want to. What you really want to do is something like this. 
so in such an event parenthesis is required but don't clutter your code with too much so this is clearly not required so the code can instead be simpler it can be something like this so this is the idea behind avoiding parenthesis next is uh, strings are immutable so uh, almost all uh, python uh, programmers will know this so i create a string called s and then i try to append to the string will it work yes it works why not but what has happened so uh, for every object python object there is an identifier you can think of it as uh, maybe loosely uh, you know uh, related to the location in memory where this object is stored so it's sort of a handle which you know the programmer can access if they wish to so in this case you know we created a string s and we are looking at the id of that string so every object will have a unique identifier and then we append it to the string two characters i and k so now now this operation is successful because we got a new string and this is the importance here what we actually did was to create a new string the original string is gone we have not actually appended to the original string rather what has happened is we have created a new string in memory so this is uh, the way python does it so this might be quite a surprising thing if you are coming from let's say c programming because in c a string is nothing but a sequence of characters or bytes stored stored in memory so when you append something in c program you are not you know uh, changing the memory location of the string you are simply appending to the end of the original string that is not the case in python as you can see in the id a new object has been created and the reason for this is strings are immutable the original string once it is created it cannot be modified any change to that string it has to be a new string another example to uh, bring home the point that strings are immutable take the last character of the string so the last character from the previous example is k can you modify k and replace it with c you can't do it because python will throw an error strings are immutable cannot do this assignment so what do you do if you want to change a particular character within the original string what you need to do is do slicing and then append to that so again this is a new string when you do a slice of the original string you are actually creating a new string and then you are appending to this effectively creating another string and that is the string that you see here so all these examples we have seen so far show that strings are immutable next up is aliasing again a very uh, uh, misunderstood concept uh, if you are coming from c or other languages so take a very simple example l is a list of three elements and i initialize k to l and then i app append 1 to l so what do i what do i typically expect uh, i expect that i have made a copy of l and then i am modifying l but that is not how python works you can see here when i appended 1 to l i have modified both k and l so this is the concept of aliasing in python what is aliasing aliasing is nothing more than another name for the original object so what is k k is nothing but another variable name which is pointing to the same object as l so there is only one object in memory which is referenced by two different names k and l so when i append to l i am effectively changing k as well because k is pointing to the same object so this is the concept of aliasing so you have to be very careful when you do assignments like this in python because you may think that you are actually making a copy you are not so now question for you a similar example you know here we were talking about uh, here we are talking about Uh, a list here we are talking about a string what happens in this case we said that there, there is aliasing going on so k is a alias of l true but here if i modify k now i get two different strings l is hello k is world 
So what happened to aliasing here? The difference is here we are talking about a list which, which is a mutable object, whereas strings are immutable. So what Python interpreter does is that when you create world, a new string is created and this new string is assigned to K. So the original string is still there in the memory and L is pointing to that string. So aliasing here doesn't work because strings are, as we uh, learned earlier, are immutable. Next up, explicit copying. So you may wonder, you know, okay, this didn't work with lists. So how do I make it work? How, uh, you know, how do I make an explicit copy of L? So the way to do it is slicing. So if you do slicing like this, you are actually making an explicit copy of L into K. So remember now, uh, K is not an alias of L. K is an explicit copy of L. So it's now a completely separate object in memory. So that is what K is. So now if you append something to L, only L is modified. K remains the same, its original value when it was copied from L. So there is also a concept of shallow copying and deep copying. So what is shallow copying and what is deep copying? So to understand this, we have to look at two levels of nesting or one level of nesting, let's say. So what we have is LL. LL is a list of a list. So L and K are both lists. And then we create LL, which is a list of L and K. Then we create a copy of LL, which is KK. So, so far so clear. Then we try to append to the inner list, which is this one. So LL0 is nothing but L. So to this L, we append one. So what happens when we do this? Unfortunately, both our objects got modified. See, our intention was to append one to this. We did not want to modify this. Even though we took an explicit copy through slicing, this has not worked for us. The reason for that is simple. What we have done is we have only copied, made a copy of LL. But internally, LL has still references to L and K. So internally, both KK and LL are pointing to only L and K. So we have done what is known as shallow copying. So to avoid this problem or to solve this problem, what we need is deep copying. And that is exactly what this is. So this is, uh, as you can see, we have solved the problem by doing a deep copy. And deep copy is possible because there is a Python module called copy. And uh, it has a function or a method called deep copy. So we have utilized that to uh, get this. Next up is operator is. So this is very simple to understand. Uh, some of you may have already encountered this. So we have two strings, S1 and S2, both are initialized to the same value Python. And if you do a comparison, you can do two types of comparison. One is is comparison and the other is double equals. Well, what is the difference between these two? So is comparison is, as you can see here, is is checking whether they are pointing to the same object, which in this case is true because Python interpreter sees that it already has a string like this. So when you create another string S2, it simply points to the same string. And Python interpreter can do this because it recognizes that strings are immutable. So there is no need to duplicate the string in memory. So when we do this operation, you can see here both are returning true. But let's do something else. Let's append two characters to both the strings. Now what happens? you will see that the result changes. So what Python interpreter has done is it has now created two separate strings, S1 and S2. And they are now pointing to two separate objects in memory, as you can see by the IDs. But if you compare them by value, they are the same because both are, of course, Pythonic. You know, the value of this in the string is, in these strings is Pythonic. 
So uh, point I want to make is that this is comparison of two objects, whether they are, uh, it's an identity comparison, whether they are the same object, whereas this one is a comparison of value. The next operator we want to look at is the in operator. So the in operator is, uh, uh, okay, before getting to the in operator, let's try to figure out what is going on in this piece of code. So some of you may already uh, see what is the problem in this code. We are trying to find whether the substring Python is a existing in the string. Python is a popular language. And we expect that this to be true, but it is uh, we, after running this, we are not getting the printout. What is the reason for this? Because find returns the index of the location. And in this case, it so happens that the index is zero because this substring is found at the index zero and zero will evaluate to false in Boolean. So obviously we made a mistake. So the correct code is this one where you should not be comparing, uh, comparing I mean, you, and this is the bug in the code. Rather, you should be writing the code this way. So find will return minus one if the substring is not found. So now you get the correct response. But there is a better way to write this code, right? So this kind of code, uh, you know, is not considered as Pythonic. In finding out the index. See, typically the function find is used uh, if you want the index of the location. So here we are not interested in the index. Rather, we want only the uh, true or false. We want to know whether Python as a substring exists in S. So this is where the membership operator, which is the in operator becomes useful. So this is a way to write Pythonic code, Python in S. So we get the expected result. I hope this is clear. The next one is uh, very simple to understand. Uh, Python is very strict about uh, the rules of typing. So here, this is a string. This is an integer. Obviously, you can't add them although you may think that they are compatible. This kind of a thing will work in many languages. For example, if you do this in PHP, it will work, but it's not going to work in uh, Python because it has very strict typing. But of course, to make this work, you have to do an explicit conversion. So what we have done, we have converted the string three into an integer, and then we have done the addition. So this works. Take the next example where we have you know uh, an array a list of three items and we take the length of l so the length of l is obviously three then we divide three by two so what do you get you get 1.5 and with 1.5 will this work obviously this won't work because you can't index a list with a floating point you can in index it only with an integer so now let's modify this code slightly Instead of uh, a list of three elements, let's have a list of four elements. What happens? Length becomes A becomes four. If you divide it, you get two. Will it work? Let's try it. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't work. The reason for that is very simple. A divided by two, even though the result is two, the type of this is float. Now, it will surprise you that this code will actually work in Python 2 but today we are using python 3 so in python 3 any uh, division like this is going to give you an integer so what is the better way to write this code a better way to write this code is to use integer division which is a double slash so wherever you are indexing into lists or tuples for that matter you know the indices have to be uh, integers you can't use a float so in those cases, you know, this is what uh, you would have, you would do. So use an integer division. So this integer division works, you know, even if, for example, I have three elements. So now if I do integer division, I am printing L. So, uh, so what I have done, I have replaced blue with orange. So that is what has happened. Okay. Next up is this code, which is 
uh, actually this code is a clear giveaway it clearly says that uh, you know the guy the person who has written this code is probably coming from c because this is typically the way they, they would write in c code because remember uh, strings are immutable strings are nothing but you know an array of uh, bytes so this is very sensible you know in c language but writing this sort of a code in python is not only inefficient but it's also a highly uh, the code becomes uh, very difficult to read and maintain so what is happening here you are taking a space and a character creating a new string then we are doing a plus equals effectively creating another string uh, in memory and the reason is strings are immutable in so effectively for this loop we are creating multiple strings which is highly inefficient what is the best way to do this in python this is what you would do so instead of doing this what you would do is simply use join which is a string method so you give space as the separator use join and you get the output it's a very simple way to do it uh, so this is how it should be done in python so other examples you know uh, so typically join and split they go as a pair so take this as an example i want to reverse it so this is the output i want so as you can see there are two types of reversals going on here each word has to be reversed and the whole list also has to be reversed so now what's the easiest way to do this without using uh, any uh, you know loops like this use join and split so what i am going to do is we use a space character to join all this then we in step then we split it using the space character so you we get the output that we want obviously this is not going to work if you know in your word you have things like this right then you, you know in these cases you use a separate character as a you know a splitting character splitting and joining you do it with a different character so then you know it would work so you have to know what kind of input you are dealing with so this is just an example to tell you that join and split are a very uh, effective in processing strings and lists so as you become more uh, well versed in python uh, you will start using join and split uh, more often so this is another alternative to do that using uh, comprehension we'll not go into it now objects are reused so uh, this is an example with integer but integers are you know uh, immutable just like strings so we will not bother too much with this example the more interesting example is this one with uh, list so what is happening here is we have a queue which is a list of two elements 3 and 1 what we are doing is we are creating r from q so we are creating r which is a list of list having uh, q three times and then we are trying to modify one of them to five so let's see what happens if you are in, if i run this so r is a list of list as you can see here okay r is a list of list inside the list you have 313131 31. and our intention is to modify r10 to five so this is r10 to 5 so this particular element we wanted to change to 5 unfortunately what has happened it has modified all of them to 5 why did this happen it happened because we are reusing q in constructing r so uh, this is the uh, reason we ended up like this so what is the better way to do this the better way to do this is to do it explicitly don't reuse q rather this is the way to do it explicitly construct three separate objects of uh, q which is 3 1 and then the rest of the code is same so now we get what we wanted so 3 1 3 1 3 1 has become 3 1 5 1 3 1 
so at this point i would give a pause and uh, let's see if you have any questions from the audience you can raise your hand i can unmute you or i can unmute everybody any questions at this point so the deep copy which you spoke about slicing yeah. also does the deep copy right no slicing is do, going to do only shallow copying so let's go back to that example we did slicing here I have it here copying so you see here we have actually done uh, slicing through slicing we made a copy of ll into kk but it has not done a copy of l and k l and k are still the same objects so this has not worked for us so we need to do deep copy okay other questions at this point i'll take one more question before we move on you can raise your hand deepesh okay deepesh uh, yeah you can unmute yourself and ask your question uh, yes sir i was about to ask the question uh, about the same thing that uh, copying and yeah. earlier example uh, that slicing has uh, made a copy and uh, it then they were a separate object that's correct yeah but yeah. Uh, the copy is only at the highest level not at the deep level oh but still like the it it's act like a, it's a deep copy no no it doesn't that's the example that i have shown here so let's go back to that example here as you can see see we have done slicing here so not this example, is not just a previous example uh is different L because l is sorry what is this Lace. example yes sir yeah here it happens this example is very trivial because there is only one level there is no less nested uh, lists or tuples here so this is a trivial example we cannot show the importance of deep copying here that's why we need to move on to a more complex example here okay okay sir so what has happened is we have done a copy of ll and stored it in kk but kk is still pointing to ln k ln k yeah so we have not made a copy of lnk we have only made a copy of ll so the result is when we change say ll0 is actually this one here yeah right ll0 is actually this one sorry it's this uh, ll0 is this so when we say ll0 and appending to this it is appending to both because it is the same object l so okay, the sir. way to avoid it is to do a deep copy right thank so you you may uh, you know want to know there is also another method called copy but oh. this is hardly ever used because there is no value in doing this reason is this is a much simpler way so copy oh. here, that you see here is nothing but shallow copying so this is very cumbersome to write copy dot copy instead shallow copying is done like this but okay. when you need deep copy then the copy module becomes useful so you do copy dot deep copy okay thank you sir okay then uh, let's move on to the next section so some of the things i may do it rather quickly okay this is a very classic thing almost every code that i see from students they are written like this so when i when any python programmer looks at this code they can immediately tell that uh, you know this guy is a beginner in python even though in your resume you may claim that you are a expert in python somebody who looks at this single line will tell you that you are a beginner in python 
So never ever have this sort of a uh, programming construct in Python code. So what is happening here? What we are doing is we are getting the length of the sequence, then taking a range on that, getting the index and using the index to uh, access the value of the element. This is very cumbersome. The much cleaner way in Python is you can access the item directly. You don't even need the index. So this is the Pythonic way of you know looping through any sequence for item in T and then you can straight away print the item. Now I know what is your next question. What if you want both the index as well as the item value? Right? So you want I as well as the value. So what do you do then? So for that there is a much better way in Python is to use a function called enumerate. So you do enumerate on the sequence. You get a tuple of two elements. One, the first one is the index. The second one is the item. So this is the way it should be done. Right? At one at position zero, four at one, eight at two, five at three. So I is the position or the index and uh, item is the actual value. So this is the right way to write code in Python. But in many cases you don't need the index. So you directly access for item in T. So this is how it should be written. So again I repeat uh, never ever use this sort of a syntax range of length of something. So another simple uh, mistake that beginners uh, make is I have a sentence here which is nothing but a string and then I want to loop through all the words. Is this going to work? Obviously this will not work because when you loop like this of a sentence, you are going to loop through the characters, not the words. So this is how you know a string works in Python. So a string is nothing but a sequence of characters. It's not a sequence of words. So if you want to do it like this, go to go back to our good old split. We saw split and join earlier. So if you use split, then you will get a, you know, you can loop through the words. But of course, this is very simplistic uh, for people who are working in machine learning, uh, typically NLP, even the split will not be enough. So in NLP, there is much more sophisticated processing. We do something called tokenizer, word tokenizer. So that will give you the words in a sentence. So that is what should be used, but I'm giving a simple example that beginners can understand. So again, another example, this is a traditional loop, right? So loop here is very simple. You have, uh, you know, four elements and then you are taking the cube of that. There's nothing wrong in this code. You know, this is a, a well-written code. You are initializing the list, then you are uh, looping through and then you are appending to the list. So there is nothing nothing wrong with this code, but this loop is too simple. So for a simple loop like this, comprehension is a much better way of doing it in Python. So this is what you would do in Python. For x in range, and then you enclose everything in a list comprehension. And this is where your expression is, x to the power of 3. There is a more functional approach map of lambda you can do and then you do a list but this is typically not recommended python allows you to do this but you know there is a much better way in python which is comprehension so there are some functional programming constructs in python which allow you to do you know the way you can do in functional programs like haskell or scala but you know uh, comprehension is a much cleaner way to do in python so remember whenever you see simple loops Think of how you can modify this loop into a comprehension. So that that's an example here. So here there is something interesting going on. I have a, a tuple of tuples. So I have basically three students. So I have a student age and uh, you know which uh, discipline they are studying in department. And I have a function here where I pass this data and I try to find if there is a match. So what do I do? I have a finder needle haystacks. OK, the variables are all nicely named. And I have a variable here is found false. 
so when i find my needle in the haystack i say is found true and then i break out of the loop after coming out of the loop i check if it is not found i say i give a print out not found so let's run this so my first call to the function students mca found asha goswami so i am printing from here i found it and i break out of the loop and after breaking out of the loop because i have modified my variable i don't print out this not found whereas in the other case john smith obviously john smith is not there so i will go through the entire loop the variable is not modified that means it is false and if it is false i print not found so it's a simple code you know this is typically how it is done in most programming languages you try to find something in a sequence if it is not found you use that variable to you know take alternative action this is how it is done in most programming languages there is nothing wrong with this code but in python there is a much better way there is what is known as a for else so look at this code this code is much cleaner because we have removed the scaffolding this unnecessary variable is found is no longer there it's no longer required because in python there is something called for else so typically if it is found you will break out of the loop and you will not print this but if it is not found python has the interpreter will go to the else statement that means if you have not uh, you know uh, break, uh, broken out of the loop it will go to the else statement and you will print out not found so many programmers are not aware of this you know so you will find still lot of python python programmers right, using this kind of variables to break uh, you know to figure out the uh, non matching condition so now you know there is a much better way which is for and else the other important thing is when you are looping through in a sequence never delete items it can give a very uh, strange results and this is not the way you know you are supposed to be looping through for loops so what is happening here i am looping through the for loop and while i am looping i am deleting elements of the list it's a terrible idea and of course this itself is a terrible idea but on top of that deleting something of a list while you are looping through the list is not a good idea same thing here for a dictionary so a dictionary also has you know it has some built in error handling so while you are looping through you are trying to delete so you know interpreter throws a runtime error so ne never a good idea to delete items when you are looping through that list combining two sequences what's the best way to do it some people do it like this again not a good idea what they are trying is they are taking out the index and using the index to get the capital get the state and then combining so this is not the way to be done uh, not the way it is to be done so how do we do it a better way is to use enumerate we already saw the use usefulness of enumerate so you get both the index and the value so value goes directly as a key to the new dictionary and using the index you can get the value of the other other uh, sequence but even this is uh, you know uh, clumsy in python there is a much better way which is the use of zip function so zip is the ideal way to ideal approach to you know combining two separate sequences so you can see here we are zipping states and capitals state we are using it as the key capital we are using it as a value so we get the result karnataka bangalore goa panaji haryana chandigarh nagaland kohima so that's the result we wanted so zip is the ideal way to combine to uh, i mean uh, combine uh, two sequences in this manner but here is another example combine two dictionaries so what we are trying to do d1 and d2 we want to combine them and create a new dictionary called d3 so is this the correct code obviously this is not the correct code because what has happened here is when you do d update d2 you are modifying d1 in place 
So you see here D has been modified in place. This is not what we wanted. What we wanted was to create D3, which is a combination of D1 and D2. Whereas uh, D3 now has become none because uh, update doesn't return anything. It modifies D1 in place. So uh, what is the better way to do it? Better way to do it is like this. You make a copy of D1, you will get D2, D3, sorry, and then you update D2 into D3. So this is the result we wanted. We don't want to change D1 and D2, but we want a new dictionary, which is a combination which includes both D1 and D2. But in more recent versions of Python, maybe Python 3.5, I'm not sure about that number, but uh, in recent versions of Python, there is a much better way to do even this, which is like this. So you do a double star of D1, double star of D2, and then you put everything into a curly bracket, which is your new dictionary D3. So by doing this, you don't change D1, you don't change D2, and you get D3, which is a combination of both. So you see here, a single line is sufficient. What we used to do with, uh, say, two lines here. So here it took us two lines. Here we are do doing it with a single line. OK, so next up, uh, we can do the same thing with the tuples, except that in tuples, you use a single star rather than double star. Element wise operations, suppose I want to combine A and B in the sense that I want C to be 11 and 22. That means element wise operations. So this is obviously not going to give, give us the correct result. What we are doing is extending the list. So we are extending A and B and getting C. This is not what we wanted. What we re really wanted was uh, C should be 11 and 22. So element wise operation, uh, we actually know the answer. The answer is zip. This is the right way to do it. So A, A, B in zip, A and B, and here you put your operation. So this will give us the result. But I have given other alternatives, you know, but they are not really important. Just for curiosity, I have given it. But the best way is this one, using zip. Okay, this is an interesting uh, example. So I am taking here, what is this? 10 to the power of 8, that is 100 million items. And I am doing a square of that and then calculating the sum. So to show this, what I need to do is I should bring up my task manager. So let's bring up my task manager. So uh, unfortunately, my memory is already at a height. See, I have 8 GB of memory already. I'm running at 8 GB. So on, you know, if I can release some memory, then probably I can. Uh, but it looks like my memory is already at the peak. So this will not be an interesting demo. But anyway, you can see how, how long it takes. So I think it should take uh, maybe around half a minute. So it's running now. Let's just look at the memory usage. OK, we can start seeing some changes. So memory usage has gone up. So I think what has happened is uh, some swapping has happened. And uh, the Python interpreter is now taking that extra memory. So it is still running. It's more than uh, 30 seconds. That is because a lot of swapping is happening. You can also look at the disk here. OK, now it's completed. Well, I've not got the result. Yeah, 46.7 seconds. OK. Uh, on the face of it, it doesn't look like a bad code. We are using list comprehension, and then we are taking a sum. But let's look at this particular code. We are doing exactly the same thing. Look at the memory consumption. It has not gone up even a single bit. It is staying flat throughout. So let's go back to the task manager. Memory consumption hasn't gone up. What's happening? OK, our computation also ended. 
so we got our result in 20 seconds whereas here it has taken us 47 seconds more than twice the result is of course the same so what is happening is when we are creating like 100 million elements because we are using a list comprehension the interpreter allocate creates a list with 100 million elements so uh, there is a memory uh, allocation for each element in this huge uh, list but the nature of our computation is that we are actually not interested in this list what we are looking for is the sum and because we are interested in the sum why not create the element only when it is needed so that is the use of a generator here we are giving generator an input of not a list but a generator meaning that the elements are created one at a time that is why you see here memory never goes up whereas in the earlier example you know uh, easily a couple of gbs uh, we lost that uh, history couple of extra gb was required to allocate memory here so here i will give a pause any questions people can ask raise your hand and i will un unmute you un uh, i will uh, unmute you any questions okay if not uh, we will continue with the session so the next one is naming look at this particular uh, piece of code the code is very simple we have some data here persons name age and the country of uh, let's say residence and we look through these persons for p in persons we want to print out we want to print out the name aged so much currently lives in so much nothing wrong with this code right the zero element is name first element is uh, age then the second element is the country but problem is somebody looking at this code uh, now in this example it may be uh, obvious but let's say in a real world uh, application the code is far from obvious the data may be initialized externally it may be uh, you know in some other file or uh, some other module and uh, you are getting the data into an, another function and there you are trying to do something like this you will have no idea what is zero what is one what is two so the naming doesn't really give a clue what kind of data you are accessing so is there a way the code can be written in a more readable fashion so the way to do it is there is a very very elegant way to do this which is you take your p which is your person and you unpack it so this is called unpacking a tuple so when you unpack it you give it useful names name age country now yes all of a sudden your code becomes more readable it's a very simple change that people can do in their code so instead of writing cryptic code like this for p in persons which is not too bad but you can actually unpack the tuple name age and country now your code becomes much more readable okay so further examples are here then there is also named tuple so there is something called a named tuple which i have given here as an example where you can do something like p dot name p dot age p dot country but uh, maybe it is useful in some cases but in most cases in your code it's easier typically you will be dealing with uh, tuples and you can unpack your tuple so this is a good way i mean this is what i normally adopt but some of you may want to use name tuples which is there in the collections module yeah but my preference is to simply do unpacking so that's about naming so another interesting example here i run this and i get an error list object is not callable so what is the reason for this error uh, so let's uh, uh, try to understand what is happening so i have here numbers i have names and i am sorting it out 
sorted numbers is equal to sorted right and i can even print it out uh, let's say i print out this sorted and i run it do i get any print out uh, print sorted sorted numbers sorted uh, Okay, sorry. Uh, because I have already executed this, that is the reason. Okay, we'll come back to this in the. Uh, let me try to explain first what is going on. So sorted is a valid uh, command in Python. It's a built-in function. So we are sorting it. Unfortunately, the mistake we have done is we have assigned it to the same name sorted. So effectively, what we have done, we have created a new variable which has overwritten the built-in function. as a result the next time we call it sorted names we get this error so now if you do a help of this you will see that now it is a list it is now no longer a function so uh, to summarize we have named our variable badly our variable is uh, having the same same name as the built in function so now we are left with a list whereas we should actually be having a built in function sorted so this is what we have a list 2458 so how do we recover our built in function so to do that we can delete sorted now after deleting sorted we are able to recover our built in function this is python's built in function sorted which is actually the uh, original function that python provides so always be clear don't name your variables in a way it in which it conflicts with built in functions okay so that's the point i wanted to make in this particular piece of code so this is again same thing we will not go into it uh, you know you have another function called cos which is sort of conflicting with a function inside math right so it's possible that you want to use both the functions so when you import it you import it as a different name cosine so now you are naming this function differently from you know your own function here which is called cos so this is one way to do it so that's about naming uh, we will pause here for questions anyone has any questions uh, someone has raised a hand no yeah arvind yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the yeah. example that you gave about the names and persons right uh, yeah. so in the you know you said one so maybe 0 1 and 2 in, because they were specified in that columns right first one was a name then the age or something living in that country yeah. but does that yeah. order need to hold when you do the other method which you which you showed as a preferred method or can they name like okay, you know let's go back to that example yeah yeah so the yeah this one yeah so here when you unpack the order is important okay right so the order in which you created is name age and country so the same order is required but if you talk about name tuple even here when you create the name tuple the order is important name age and country because otherwise the interpreter wouldn't know which one to assign where pardon otherwise the interpreter won't know right which one what is what yeah yeah that's correct mm. the order yeah. is important Mm okay yeah. thank you Okay any other questions one more question we can take before we move on to the next section Mohit is your mic on Okay I'll allow your mic yeah Mohit go ahead uh, Yeah my doubt is with regards to the sorted function like is it yeah. uh, like uh what you said is an example in sorted like every python function can be overridden or just there's some specific function which can be overridden overridden no, no everything can be over overridden like this that is basically the programmer's mistake of using the wrong yeah. variable name oh. yeah. yeah in fact uh, i yeah. did not initially recognize this uh, it it only came about when i used to do python trainings where beginners they uh, very often when they create strings they name their strings str yeah and it ended up that they were overwriting the built in function 
and in some cases they will not notice it because uh, str is compatible with str yeah so the methods will still be valid but in this particular case that's why i used the sorted as an example because uh, sorted originally is a function but when you assign it it becomes a list that is how you know that's what sorted returns and then the problem becomes much more obvious yeah okay let's move on to functions so this is uh, functions and classes uh, so this is uh, you know a lot of people uh, especially in machine learning community i think they have grown up uh, on a, on a lot on c programming so when they come to python most of their code is using functions but uh, you know they can uh, refactor a lot of the code into classes and objects which which will uh, you know improve quite a lot uh, improve their code quite a lot but of course uh, you know data scientists typically don't care too much about how well their program is written they are more uh, worried about their model the performance of the model so but as python programmers generally we should prefer the use of classes rather than functions so that's general comment i wanted to make uh, variable scope this is an example so let's see what this example is all about so we have a function here appender and uh, a i append to a and i get so initially i had a list which is 1 and 3 and i call this function and i append 3 to a and surprisingly this worked you know although a is like a global variable we did not pass a into the function but it so happens that you know lists are valid from uh, the local scope so that is why we were able to access a but then the results are uh, let's look at the next example you will be surprised what happens we are doing more or less the same thing right we have our a which is a global variable we know that a is accessible inside uh, the function so we are calling appender but now our function is different we are saying a plus equals 5 and suddenly we get an error local variable a reference before assignment so now for beginners this is very confusing how come here it is able to access the global variable whereas here it is not and the reason for that is here the operation is very different we are appending to a so the way interpreter looks at it is i don't have any a here so i will fall back to the global a whereas the way interpreter looks at this operation plus equal now it doesn't go to global scope because this is a very specific operator this is extend operator here it expects a to be a local variable so beginners i mean uh, beginners are very uh, justified in complaining about this you know how is one to know that this is very different from this so only experienced python programmers know this so here it is looking at local scope so how do you overcome this problem the way to overcome is to tell the interpreter explicitly i am going to use a from a global scope now this operation will work right so that is uh, an example of variable scope another one is this one this is pass by reference which is common in uh, many languages including c so in c you, you tend to point uh, pass pointers by reference in fact we call them references okay let's look at this uh, call me uh, is a function so we start with a of uh, four elements and then we call this function and let's see what the printout uh, tells us so we print inside before and after we have done append zero to l so how come uh, even after appending zero we are getting the same uh, values and you will because uh, all list 
we are not uh, sorry passed by reference we are not passing the value so this l is actually pointing to the global l but how is it that even after appending the global is not changed the reason for that is simple we are actually doing slicing here remember from our earlier discussion slicing does a copy so although you passed by reference the minute you do slicing you are actually taking a new copy and you are appending to that copy and unfortunately you are only printing the original l you are not actually printing the copy the copy is appended and it is completely lost so you end up with the same answer but if i change this code like this suppose i change it like this you will get the expected result because we are actually passing by reference and we are simply appending to the same list so this is perfectly valid code the mistake the programmer has done here is to do a copy so this is not to be done default argument okay this is another very strange thing and uh, if you go to stack overflow or other uh, python forums there is a lot of discussion behind this particular problem and uh, different uh, and the programmers will typically belong to two camps so one will say that you know uh, the way python interpreter is doing it is wrong the other guy will say no no what python interpreter is doing is, is correct so philosophically let's not debate which is correct let's understand the problem and see how as a programmer we should tackle it so the idea is very simple we have a function which takes a single argument and if while calling if this argument is omitted it defaults to a null uh, rather an empty list okay so let's look at the output here and uh, let's see what is going on so i call foo obviously i am not passing anything so this is what to do. yeah so i am not passing anything and what i am doing here i am appending hello so i get hello okay fine uh, there's nothing uh, wrong here so i started with a empty uh, list and to that empty list i appended hello this is what we expect because we called it with without any argument so i start with an empty one and i appended hello to it so this is the result i get so perfectly valid result then i call it again foo so what do you expect so some people will say you know i am calling it again so i expect it to start with an empty list and i expect the same result hello but surprise surprise when i call it again i get hello hello why is this happening because python remembers i mean every call is not going to give you a new initialized empty list this initialized empty list is created only once when the function is defined so i repeat that this initialization is not done every time the function is called this initialization is done only once when the function is defined and the, the reason for that is because this particular assignment here is mutable it's a mutable list so the same object is modified in memory that is why when we call this foo again it remembers the previous but now i do something different instead of calling you know foo without anything i give it a starting point which is blue which is 6 here so now what happens to blue i i append 6 which is expected yeah but now i go back to foo what happens again i go back to my original default initialization so now i end up with hello 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 so it is all very confusing but the only thing you need to remember is the default argument is created only once when the function is defined and this is a problem if your initialization depends on a mutable object so how to solve this solving this is simple typically don't write code like this where your default argument is a mutable object instead if you want something like this you can initialize it like this none and depending on what you want you can do initialization like this if none then internally you initialize it to a none element and so forth right 
So you can do stuff like this. So all that we have done to improve the code is instead of using a mutable object, we have replaced it with none. So this is a much better way to write default documents. Late binding, not going to go through this because lack of time, we will skip this. And uh, is instance, uh, yeah, we'll skip this. You can look it up later on. Okay, using tuples in and out of functions. Okay, this is very important. So take a look at this particular piece of code. We have a function which computes Euclidean distance between two points. And uh, yeah, uh, we are defining points in three dimensional space. So AX, AY, AZ, BX, BY, BZ. And then our good old zip function. Okay, so we zip it XY, X minus Y, square sum square root. So this is our Euclidean distance. So nothing wrong with this code. Euclidean distance 1, 2, 3 is point A. 1, 2, Arvind, you are there? Yeah. Yeah. OK, you are breaking. OK, anybody looking at this will be confused because there are six arguments. Whereas ideally we should be having only two arguments because we are computing the distance between two points. So what is the better way to do this? Better way is to use tuples. 1, 2 and 3 becomes your point A. 1, 2 and 10 becomes your point B. Now your function becomes clear. Now your code becomes much more readable. You can call the same function which has six arguments like this. So what you are doing is at the point of calling you are unpacking. This is called unpacking. We already saw how to do unpacking in that for loop. If you remember when we looked at uh, name, age and country. That So this is also unpacking, but here there we were unpacking as part of the for loop. Here we are unpacking during the function call. So A unpacks and it becomes these three arguments. B unpacks and it be becomes these three. Simple, right? So this is unpacking during function call. Now the reason we do this is let's assume that this function is coming from a library. You don't have the luxury to change this. Maybe this is legacy code. No, you can't change this, but at least you can control how you call it. You can make your own code more readable, even if the original function is written in a very, you know, uh, uh, ungainly manner. But what if you had the chance to refactor this code? How would you do it? If I had the chance to refactor it, this is how I would write it, right? My now has only two parameters, A and B, and I can call it straight away. My A and B is defined from the get go, uh, from the outset as tuples, and I would define my function based on tuples, and I would process internally from tuples. So now this code is much easier to follow. So this is a code which is better by design. So whenever you are passing in and out of functions, it is better to do it using tuples. OK, now the other two parts because of lack of time, I'm not going to go through it. You can look at it. File handling. This is a typical uh, file uh, file handling uh, process. Open, do something with the file handle, and then close the file. But what happens if you forget to close? You will have you will be left with a open file handle, which may be open for the rest of the program. Not required. So a better way to refactor this code is use the with statement. This is in Python. It is known as a context manager. Uh, so uh, with statement with open as f and then you indent it f dot write. So now what happens 
even if you forget to close it in fact you are not recommended to call close because as long as as soon as you exit this with statement the python interpreter will automatically close the file handle for you which means that subsequent to this if you try to do a write it will fail because already the file has been closed so that is the power of this with statement you don't have to you know remember whether to you know close it or did you not close it you know so automatically it closes the file handle for you another important thing in python is lbyl and eafp so it looks very cryptic lbyl is look before you leap what does it mean let's take this example uh, the logic in this code is simple easy to understand so i import this os path module and i say first i do a check in the file system is this file present if it is present i open it otherwise i give a print out file is missing okay simple code but this is typically not recommended in python look this is called look before you leap what is recommended by python programmers is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission in other words you don't check whether the file is there in the file system you go ahead and try to open it and if it fails then you use exceptions to handle it. so this is the preferred way to do it in python not this now you may ask uh, you know does it make a difference yes it makes a difference because there is a non trivial delay between the time you check whether the file is present and the time you actually open it this may be few milliseconds uh, you know maybe a uh, few seconds who knows so during this delay it's possible that the file is deleted so there is actually no use of actually checking and then opening so the correct way to do it is easier to ask for forgiveness than permission so you go ahead and try to open it if it fails let exception handle it so this is a better way to write the program so we have come to the end of the session now i will unmute everybody for questions any questions you can raise your hand you can unmute yourself and then ask a question hello uh, is it audible yes yes i can hear you okay i Are just wanted to know like who is this is sanjeev here i i was earlier also trying to ask but uh, my unmute uh, was not uh, yeah yeah go ahead yeah, yeah. Enabled. please ask it even if i raise a hand unmute was not enabled anyway so i just wanted to ask this that uh, if we i want to uh, debug the environment basically uh, why i am asking because you are using the visual studio so is there a handy example where you can uh, uh, lead us through or you can tell us whether any debugger is available or not uh, the way we used to debug vc++ applications is it possible yeah. to debug a code of python yeah yeah definitely so i can't show you here because debugging is not so simple in a notebook environment but if you take a python script you can do debugging so uh, vs code has lots of extensions as you can see here so these are all the extensions that i have installed and uh, you know i have this python intellisense which includes for example it includes intellisense linting debugging jupyter notebooks so all this is coming as part of this uh, extension so in, if your vs code is uh, installed with this uh, even if it's not installed you can just search and install it it is trivial so to give you a hands on view of how to debug we can do that as well so let's say i copy this whole thing i create a new uh, create a new file and i will name it as uh, i'll give it a name so let's say examples dot py okay and then i will put a breakpoint here 
and having put the breakpoint, I go to my debugger here, run and debug because I have not done earlier in this workspace, it is asking me this. So run and debug and I will say Python file. So it is creating the uh, terminal for debugging purpose. Okay, here it has given some issue because uh, actually PowerShell is having some issues, but you can switch to, for example, uh, command prompt, the Windows default command prompt that, that may give. Anyway, here uh, you, you can see here, we are already at the breakpoint. The session is running and I can put a break here, for example, and I can run it. Now I'm here and I can look at the value of my variable A, which is 10. Okay, and I can fine. single step yeah. Yeah. and you. I can Thank go you. to the Thank else yeah. and I return. Yeah. Thanks, Arvind. Yeah. Any other questions? Next. If no questions, say any feedback on the session, did you find it useful? Alia, yes, please. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hello, and Mr. Arvind. I am, I am Mr. Ahmed from Iraq. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm uh, I entered from uh, another uh, account. Sure, sure. Go uh, ahead. Would you, would you share? Uh, thank you. Would you share this uh, uh, codes uh, on the on the uh, Devopedia? Yes, uh, this uh, entire notebook will be available to you. Uh -huh. Yeah. And of course, uh, this session is also recorded, so you can also follow the recording later on YouTube. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. OK. So any questions and feedback from other participants? I believe all of you have been unmuted, so you should be able to ask right away. Okay, if uh, no questions, then we 